You're listening to the Outpost Podcast with Dr. Ray Mitch. Well, greetings, everyone, to uh, on live or on location, relatively live um, <laughs> recording of the Outpost podcast. I am Dr. Ray Mitch, and uh, I am here on location at Sacred Heart um, Jesuit Retreat House. And uh, we are here for the Spring 24 uh, Silent Retreat. So, I, I did this last, um, last semester in October, and obviously things change a good bit. Um, it is a windstorm out there. I point that way because of where the window is. Um, and so trying to record something in the midst of all of that with all the electronics and acoustics and all the other stuff is really kind of ridiculous. So I moved indoors uh, so that we could have, or I could have some uh, more uh, anxiety-free opportunity to talk about the retreat and the beginnings of it. And uh, twice a year, actually three times a year, um, I, uh, and I and SGI uh, sponsor a retreat for uh, students two times a year. We have enrolled students here, and CCU has partnered with us to be able to uh, support and make this possible for students to come and um, engage in something very, very different than they're accustomed to. So um, we are here. I'm going to uh, be releasing a, a recording of each one in each day. So this is the end of day one. We started last night at um, uh, last night at 7.30 and we got together and we had a very lively meeting of getting people oriented and all the logistics of being in silence and what that means and the challenges and everything that uh, the retreatants, and that's usually what we, how, how I tend to refer to them when we're here, um, face. And that's really the biggest challenge. And I think that's instructive, I think, of us um, and for many of us when we look at how saturated our lives are with sound and noise and a din that we have just gotten so accustomed to. And so um, I, the, there is so much about this silent retreat and, and um, engaging God in silence and solitude. Now, that doesn't mean there are no people around you. It just means being alone ultimately with God. And so and that's a big challenge because there's a lot about our, even our faith tradition, depending on where you're coming from, <clears throat> that is always surrounded by interacting with people. And that's good. That has a place. But on the other hand, <clears throat> it tends to veer us away from sitting and listening to God. And you know, a prime example of that, which I think is very instructive, is the prophet Elijah. He had just had this, the pinnacle of his career as a prophet in um, uh, defeating, if you want to put it that way, it wasn't really a contest, but um, defeating the priests of Baal uh, on Mount Carmel. And he had, he just was at the, at the peak of his performance. And um, and so he uh, does uh, almost a marathon and a half of running uh, to arrive at Jezreel before everyone else does and found that he was every bit as much of the do uh, dog in the doghouse as he ever was with the queen. I'm not real sure what he expected, but be that as it may. And so he withdrew. He withdrew to a cave and he had some very heartfelt <clears throat> conversations with God in that cave. And the interesting thing about that is God revealed himself to Elijah. And that's where the example starts to begin because, or begins, because 
God wasn't in a whirlwind. He wasn't in a fire. He wasn't in an earthquake. He was in a very still, small voice. And Elijah had to come out from that cave and be quiet and to be able to listen. Because the reality is, is that we can't hear a still, small voice unless we are quiet in our soul and in our being. And that's ultimately what silence offers us. It provides us a context. doesn't mean we will automatically go there, but it does provide us a context in which to engage God in a very different way. Bible teachers are great. They, they, what ultimately they do is to build our level of knowledge about God. Silence introduces us to a new kind of knowledge of being with God and being with him in his presence. And I think ultimately, in a lot of ways, that's exactly what we avoid. So essentially what happened last night, and I'm, I'm not going to out anybody. I'm just kind of curating the things that people said during that meeting. But, but the thing that really, I think, caught my attention about last night was how many different images and visions of God there were that were represented there. And how many of those was, was the embodiment of Blaise Pascal's um, famous quote, <clears throat> God made man in his own image and man returned the favor. We had a variety of images of God that were all made in the image of the person who was speaking. And so we'd have one person say, I don't know that I want to really talk to God because what if he asks or expects me to do something different than what I have planned? And I don't want to deal with that. And, and so ultimately, the, the challenge and the discouragement and everything else is built on a vision of God that is disconnected from the God of Scripture and Jesus of Scripture. And so there's so much that came together even in that conversation, so many connections, so many um, distortions about God, partly because of the impact of the things that are going on inside of us, the color, who God is and how he is and how he relates and and the degree of love he has. I think we make summary judgments about our past and the things that we've, we've experienced. And we are sure that we are that case that will outstrip God's ability to redeem. And so, um, <clears throat> so it was a very, very, I don't know how to describe it other than lively uh, conversation that we had last night. And it was good. It was good. And, and the reality is, is that it was typical. Uh, it, it seems like at the beginning of the, the retreat, of these retreats, and I've done almost 40 of them, uh, there is always all of this chaos that the person experiences, the people that are here experiences. I just spilled my coffee. Um, that that uh, people experience, and it boils over almost. It's like it's just waiting, and then silence kind of unlocks it, and it just kind of bubbles, not just bubbles. I mean, it bursts onto the surface, and people actually realize that they have an opportunity to voice those very things. And when they voice them, oftentimes they are, are oftentimes overrun with shame, and yet there is a lack of confidence or even a lack of trust in God being able to handle their doubts and their anger and their frustration and all of that. And the, the reality is, is God has understands, our Abba understands that we have such a limited view of him and the world that when we spout off the way we do, it's not like he rises up and strikes us dead. Actually, I think what rises up is the compassion for our limited view and how little we actually know. And it's not an anger over it. It's not even an anger, I don't think, uh, over being treated unfairly or misunderstood, which is usually our worst fear is being misunderstood in our motives. And I don't, th I don't think God operates that way. He, 
he has a secure, if you want to use psych terms, excuse me, I'm going to have a cup, a uh, drink of coffee. But I think he, he has a secure enough sense of himself and who he is because our insecurities come from our relationships with humans. God doesn't have that. And so we don't trust that. We, you know, just like I said, Blaise Pascal, we make God in our own image and then we worship that God and we wonder why we're so disappointed all the time. And that's very much a part, I think, of what, what is confronted and, uh, and the silence here absolutely seems to unlock it and suddenly it bursts on the scene and people are absolutely chagrined and and horrified at the at the things that are coming out of their mouth and it's they're they've been there all along they have been toxifying and poisoning them all of that time and that is very much a part of what what happens here and what and i think partly i think that's one of the reasons why um, we avoid silence because it prompts us into honesty it prompts us into authenticity and we we walk into an environment like this and it's like suddenly we we are given the freedom to voice our deepest fears, maybe not our deepest fears, but a very deep fears that we have about ourselves, about God, and about other people. And that very much comes into play, and it shows up, and it bubbles over, usually in the first night of the discussion that we actually have. And usually the question I ask is, what are your hopes, what are your fears, and what are your expectations of a time like this? And the irony is, is that in a lot of cases, people have expectations that meet their agenda rather than being willing to submit to the revealing of God's agenda for this time. And that's not easy. I, I'm the last to say that it's easy. I understand how difficult it is, but it is part of the landscape here that it, it is nothing short of remarkable and maybe I could use the word miraculous, what happens from a Thursday night conversation to a Sunday Sunday morning conversation? And the irony is, is it crosses the very thing that we just finished celebrating in Easter, from a Friday to a Sunday. And for us, it's a Thursday night to a Sunday and what happens during that time is nothing short of remarkable. It doesn't take a Bible teacher. It doesn't take, you know, a, a key thing to read or anything like that. It is trusting God enough to be free in his presence. And when we do, we end up finding that he loves us anyway, in spite of the fact that we, what we think about that and what we're saying. So, that's, that's a lot of what silence does. And I think for a lot of reasons, that's why people avoid it. Because it, it is so disorienting. Now, I've got a couple of people. Let's see, a couple? I've got at least one. I talked to him this afternoon. That is doing this a second time. And I've had a number of students, just to give you some context. I've had a number of students over the years that actually refer to this place as Narnia because it seems like they enter this the gate uh, at the at near the road here at, in Sedalia and they enter another universe time runs differently there's a sense of god more than ever before you know they see themselves differently they relate to other people differently it's all very different and it's very parallel to what we know of the stories in Narnia. The children, when they're transported, however they're transported to Narnia, they're different people there. They understand the world differently there, even though it's changed a lot, even from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and then to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It, it, it just had changes a lot. And so that same thing happens here, is that we change and then we bring this we with us into this environment and we realize how much has changed and what places we have not occupied before or anything like that. So um, 
a lot happens in this first 24 hours of a silent retreat and not the least of which of those things is the detoxification from sound and and noise and din and distraction and all the other things that go with it now the reality is is we don't prohibit people from using their their you know using their cell phones or anything like that because they've got a choice to make every time they enter into this universe they have a choice to make are they going to continue what they did outside of this universe or are they going to actually experiment with trying something different and a lot of people do i you know it's it, it it's a hard habit to break at the same time we begin to confront not only ourselves but also the god of the universe who's waiting to meet us here now waiting is a time-based word he's here anyway he he desires to have us come and meet him in an environment that is free from all the distractions and all the other things that go along with it and that's that's what a place like this is so you know, if, for example, you're considering um, engaging in a silent retreat, which my hope will be in the future that we can do more of these, not just with CCU students, but with anybody that wants to come, that if you're considering that, it's not to intimidate you from not coming. It's like, I don't want to do anything like that. I don't want to unpack things that I'm afraid I know exist and I'm don't want to look at those things and so forth and that that's fine maybe it's not your time to do that that's fine you don't there's no requirement or compulsion to do it what good is that you do things under compulsion what good is it other than compliance it's not choice it's not a motivation of love it's none of those things and so um so that that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what this first 24 hours or so is like at a silent retreat it is harder than most people think i'm i'm going to be very curious we're about I don't know, an hour away or so before our, our uh, very first meeting after after being here 24 hours and um, i'll be very curious to hear the stories and there will be stories as a matter of fact, some of the more significant stories are, I don't know that anything has changed. I think that's even more important than, than you know, rainbows and butterflies. I, I think it's far more because we finally have gotten around to being honest and we keep looking to see God in a, the way that we want to see him rather than how he reveals himself and that requires ultimately for us that requires trust i trust him to reveal himself as he sees fit rather than i want him to reveal himself as i want to see it or as i want to see him and that's that's one of the biggest challenges i think the thing the other thing and i'll end on this point I think one of the things that 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 is the biggest struggle at a place like this is it confronts our need for control and how fundamentally opposed because we are so committed to controlling outcomes controlling appearances controlling perceptions controlling all sorts of things including god himself even though i think we know that's a fool's errand <laughs> I, I think it confronts our compulsion for control and we it also confronts how little we trust and that's the plight of being human it is not an indictment of being human we have to rediscover how to live fully human and we think that that means how to live fully sinful i'm not sure god sees it that way particularly if if we have established a relationship with god to say look i want you to be lord of my life i want to live in in alignment with your values <clears throat> but
but do I trust you? I can say all those things, but that doesn't necessarily translate into a, 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 a sincere attempt to do things differently and to trust what the outcomes will be rather than control what the outcomes should be. And that's a big part of this <clears throat> short, very short journey it is two and a half days. Maybe if you stretch it, it could be three days, full days, three 24-hour periods. But even still, I, I, I invite you to consider, uh, if you're out there and you're, you're um, considering uh, doing a silent retreat, keep your eye on sgi-net.org, our digital home. You can find out everything there is to find out about silent retreats. And, and what we do, we have those that are sponsored by CCU, so that's just for CCU students. But we have those sponsored by C SGI, and we have a dire need for people to support the effort to make this accessible to as many people as we possibly can. They're not cheap. And so anything we can do to offset the cost for people coming and making it making it more possible for them to come would be hugely beneficial and a, a huge uh, impact, I think, for the people that actually do come. So um, on, on that point, and I'm not going to belabor it, but anything that you're willing to do to contribute to SGI uh, would be greatly appreciated. It is tax deductible. You're able to to write it off on your taxes. I would, I would say, of course, I'm biased. I would say this is a, uh, uh, a, um, <laughs> a very well-deserving uh, organization that is growing to, to reach out to the younger generation and anyone else that wants to come to be introduced and, and to engage in this thing that we call silent retreats. And this has been a longstanding tradition in other um, church traditions, like the Catholic Church. It's not as well um, attended, if you will, or even spoken of in the evangelical church. And that's too bad. I think a lot of people are missing out on a tremendous opportunity to meet God of the Bible, not the God of their stereotypes or their own making. So. That will be it for today. Thanks so much for joining me. And until I see you next time, love ya. Later. Bye.